After the near tragedy of Apollo 13, a NASA review board is set up to find out what caused the accident, and they very quickly find the uh, ruptured fuel cell which caused the explosion, and it's a very correctable mistake. And so they can say, yes, you can go ahead with uh, your Apollo program, NASA. So with uh, revised checklists and new safety procedures and quality control indexes, NASA is determined to continue an aggressive strain of lunar exploration. Nine months later, Apollo 14 is racing to the moon. The commander is Alan Shepard, the first American in space. This is his second space mission in 10 years. Shepard had been felled in 1963 by a rare and aggressive ear complaint, an inner ear complaint called Munerson's disease, which affected his balance and he was uh, removed from flight listing of all NASA air and spacecraft. So he was not able in this 10 year gap, despite being the first American in space, uh, to have another mission. But with the use of an experimental ear surgery um, developed by Dr. William House, um, Alan Shepard was completely clear again to fly NASA spacecraft. So he marched into the office of Deke Slayton in 1969 and said, give me command of Apollo 13. And they said, well, you're not quite ready for this one, Al. Uh, why don't we hold you off until the next mission? And that, of course, proved to be a, a incredible stroke of luck for Alan Shepard, of course, because of what happened to Apollo 13. So he was assigned to 14 with his rookie crew. Again, one of the best rookie crews in all of NASA, uh, Stu Rusa and Edgar Mitchell. Their destination... Apollo 13's landing site, the Frau Moro Highlands. Apollo 14 uh, suffered a lot of problems getting down onto the surface, perhaps even more problems than Apollo 11 suffered getting down for the first time. Uh, what happened was that as they started to make their descent, towards the lunar surface in their lunar module Antares, Shepard and Mitchell suddenly got their abort switch indicator had gone active. And what this meant was that the switch is supposed to only go active when an astronaut has his finger on the button for blowing the descent stage in case they need to come back and rendezvous with the uh, command module. The problem was that not only would it ruin their chances for a lunar landing if this switch caught accidentally um, with the lunar module instead of being face up as it should be for an abort they were instead pitched over like this so that their engine could fire and slow them down to drop them down. That meant that Apollo 14 could be out of fuel by the time they got back to the lunar module Kitty Hawk with Stu Rusa inside. So the mission control says, you know, maybe it's just a loose ball of sodden or something. Uh, Ed, would you tap on the panel behind the abort switch? So Ed pulls out a torch and lightly taps the panel and the abort light uh, switched off and, and on his computer register, the one went to a zero, and so we knew that the uh, abort switch had reset. Problem was, we didn't know if it was gonna do this again. If we got that problem during the final descent, it turns into a bad day. So the guys at MIT, the Massachusetts Institute of Technology that designed the computer for the abort, the, the AGs, they had to come up with a solution that would make the computer ignore the abort switch. So uh, 
they had to come up with this plan in 47 minutes because that's the time it takes to go round around the moon. They came up with this deal and they inputted it and sure enough it worked. And so they started their main descent and then Apollo 14 runs into more problems. Alan Shepard and Edgar Mitchell run into uh, a lot more problems in that their radar, which is supposed to pick up range and velocity of the ground beneath them at 10,000 feet, fail to acquire the ground beneath them, their landing site at Frau Moro. So they're coming in down and down and down and closer and closer and closer and still no radar. And so we, we decide basically to ask Alan Shepard, okay, would you switch the unit off and on again? So Al flips the breakers off, waits for a couple of seconds for everything to shut down, and then flips the breaker back on again. And then the, sure enough, the radar started picking up the ground beneath them. And now we're getting darn close. We're about 7,000 feet about above the lunar surface. A little bit lower than we want to be, but Alan Shepard takes over manual control of the lunar module and starts to bring himself and Edgar Mitchell down for their final approach. And the, Fram, the landing site at Frau Moro proves challenging because Al looks around him and can't find any flat landing spot. The best choice he has is to land on the side of a hill which is a pretty risky solution uh, when your lunar module could tip over. And if he landed on the hill and the thing tipped over, game over. So Al Shepard starts to bring Antares down with Edgar Mitchell guiding him using the radar and looking out the window uh, as Al Shepard concentrates on working the controls and seeing out of his own window to try and get them down. And then they get the contact light, engine shut down, boom, on the lunar surface. Then the lunar module just leans over to one side as, but the thing's not about to collapse, that's just the landing gear realigning so that the thing's balanced out and weighted properly. But other than landing on a side of the hill, they were dead stop right on the landing site. Apollo 14 achieved an accuracy at landing, or Al Shepard rather, achieved a greater accuracy at landing than any other moon mission before or after. And it was February 5th, 1971. And then uh, in the first of two spacewalks, Alan Shepard uh, gets out of the lunar module and he deploys the first stage in what would eventually, on the next mission, become the Lunar Roving Vehicle. It's a small hand cart that Alan Shepard developed out of a golf buggy uh, and he uses it to haul over 75 pounds of moon rocks back to the LEM. And uh, on their... They, they, put up, they put up the flag and get a brilliant picture of Alan Shepard next to the next to the United States flag with the earth behind him over his shoulder which is one of the most famous pictures taken on the moon and on their second EBA near the end Alan Shepard even finds time to convert his rock sampler into a golf club and so he says we're going to try a little sand trap shot here and he puts a genuine six iron on the bottom of his uh, contingency sample return and then takes out of his pouch a little golf ball, drops it on the ground, he had two of them, dropped the first one on the ground, hit it, it didn't quite start off properly, takes the other ball out, drops it, hits it, and he says, there you go, straight as a dime, miles and miles and miles, and that ball Ooh, way, way, way out, probably literally miles, is Alan Shepard's drive in 1-6 gravity on the moon.
And one day someone will find that little golf ball. One day, many years in the future, someone will be doing a spacewalk on the lunar surface and they'll say, hey, there's a golf ball down there. Apollo 14 was, was an amazing success and uh, they successfully blasted off and came home. Alan Shepard is probably the first person to cry on the moon. This being his first mission in 10 years, he got a little bit emotional and uh, Edgar Mitchell, while I was working on the moon, says, yeah, I think maybe Al Shepard maybe shed a tear or two at seeing the beauty of the Frau Moro Highlands. But Frau Moro is nothing compared to the up and coming landing sites when NASA begins a bold new series of missions.